on the last episode of Dr. Girlfriend. And then people do a double take. They look at me from head to toe. And they're like, you're an opera singer? I remember thinking like, oh, I'm a failed Asian because I didn't get into a UC. Or There's always been a pressure to make money. What are your parents doing? Why did they let you get into singing? All the professors were like, if you want to make money, you need to switch majors right now. Because <laughs> follow me down the aisle to the grub and shine. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm Judy. And I'm Lee. And this is... Dr. Girlfriend. Mindy, this career, it's not a typical nine to five job and you don't get paid a weekly or bi-weekly salary. Yeah. How, how is that for you? Like, how do you make money? How do you book gigs? How often yeah. do you? I love talking about money. Let's talk about money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're still asking that question every day. Me and my roommates, we're all, I live with three other musician guys, uh, all very accomplished, two string players, one timpanist. Um, we, uh, we, every day, like, we're basically, we talk about money. It's like, how, how do we, how do, what's our next hustle? What's our next, <laughs> we're talking about hustles these days, but maybe early on in the career, we were talking more about, like, what orchestras to play with, what groups to work with. Um, in terms of money, it's, yeah, it's a lot like, it's a little bit bohemian, to be honest. Like, I've always been like, oh, really touchy and feely and not practical, but in a try to be as practical as I can while doing what I'm doing. So, I mean, so for a classical singer, I can't speak to being a, some, in other professions that are singers, but in a classical singer's profession, your first real stable job is a church job. You sing, I, so I've been singing at churches for like the last 10 years of my life. I've gone to church maybe more than most Christians. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's like, that could be anywhere from 500 to $700. It feels almost like passive income because you're practicing your voice every week. Uh, you kind of just show up for a few hours for rehearsal on Thursday night, and then you show up for church service and a rehearsal beforehand. Sometimes you rehearse or you do more services after that. So that's a few hundred dollars. It's kind of like, Food, gas, a little bit of rent money, okay? Is it's that like, a week? What? Is that for singing for one week? You get Yeah, for one week, you usually have like a rehearsal and then you do like the the service on Sundays. Okay, and that's and then, a couple hundred dollars? Yeah, it's a, it's like, it pays really well. I mean, it's actually that's like good. from $25 an hour to $40 an hour. Yeah, that's yeah. So it's, you know, it's not bad. But then if you think about it, it's a freelance job. So you have to pay your own taxes. You get to write a bunch of stuff off, so... There's, there's that. You don't have health insurance. Oh yeah. So you yeah. Get that. You got to figure that out yourself. Is that like a, just contracting? I don't yeah, know. Yeah. So you're like a staff singer. You're like, you're a cantor. You're a hired, you're a hired singer for like the church season. I see. Or what, until what you're. Church, what is a church season? I How guess a church that? season could be um, like, usually church starts up in like September and then it kind of goes on break uh in like june really I thought church was all year yeah i thought church was no 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 church is definitely all year but like the uh usually in the summers they let the choir take breaks and then they, they they'll usually have like every church does it differently but you'll sometimes you'll have like soloists come in and sing or they'll do a uh smaller version of their regular music program um, during the summer uh, so during the summer, that's when you want to do other things anyway. Like you might want to travel, like as a classical singer, you might travel and do a festival or you might perform in some summer. Yeah. So usually there's like summer activities or you just sit around and wonder what's going on with your music life. You're like, am I going to get a gig this year? This coming year. <laughs> so now that I've got, uh, after a few years, so the first few years is scary for everybody getting out of school. You're like, how, how are your connections? it's it's like a constant you're constantly improving yourself working on songs to uh audition for people mm -hmm. and you're you're constantly playing you you can't even even begin to like think about the money part which i think people who have money or have a financial support who are musicians and artists they can get farther quicker it's just a means to get little like get farther a little quicker cuz you don't have to worry about your rent or you you might be able to have more voice lessons with famous teachers who charge hundreds of dollars an hour, you know? Um, so as a scrappy singer, you know, I was, 
I also I chose the the grad school program I had was a fully stipend um, full scholarship type of program so that made sense for me wow yeah I didn't know it, that. that's just how it is I'm very very lucky uh, so that kind of started an interesting chapter of of auditioning for a lot of professional choral groups um, auditioning for operas opera companies um, all that stuff. It's like every month is different. Every week is different. Um, and you just kind of like at, at the end of the month or you just kind of, I just kind of have like all these different paychecks, you know, like a few hundred dollars there. And you're just like, all right, I'm going to make it through for the next few months or wow. next month. <laughs> so much time in my early, mid twenties out of, out of uh, grad school was like, all right, like my friends and I would just joke like, all right, well, we've got like $20 in our account. What are we going to do? Like, but you know, maybe when there was $20 in my account, I was also putting on a shiny dress and singing in an auditorium with a thousand people. So it's, it's, it's this principle of being a princess and a pauper or prince and yeah. pauper type of uh, dynamic when you, when you talk about a classical an early classical singer's kind of like life yeah, yeah like from early career to maybe like me as a young slightly established like budding type of singer uh it's yeah it's it's a lot of the uh, i'll be somebody will be pouring champagne for me after a, a a concert at a reception and there's a lot of nice wealthy patrons coming to congratulate you on your work and you're like oh thank you thank you and you're like exhausted and then you go home and then you're like well what do I what do I eat this week like got gotta not get the guac wow. in, in in Chipotle because like <laughs> I, I gotta save money you know because I, I need the money to live so yeah. there's a lot of that it, it there's a lot of these really high moments where you're like wow I worked really hard to produce this really beautiful art and then, and then there's a lot of the, oh my gosh, but this, this isn't paying me. Like, what am I, what do I need to keep doing? So it's just like every year is a new, new chance to, after every season, like musical season, which is also kind of like the September to May, June type of thing. You, you've, you've done enough gigs where you've gotten better, you have more connections. So each season, I'd say like, maybe your pay goes up a little bit more for each. It, it's all per contract basis. Um, so there, there, um, so, so gigs would range from anywhere in the beginning from like 250 to like $700 and, and like $700 used to be like, oh my God, that's so much. And then, and then it just kind of, it, sometimes you'll be, I'll, I'll do gigs and it'll be like a couple, you know, maybe it's some thousands of dollars. And then it'll be like some gigs that are a hundred dollars. It just depends and then you have to do the calculations of like how much time are you actually taking to prepare for a role is is but the time you take to prepare some music can come back later so then when it comes back later you don't have to use all that time to learn that piece of music so in that way the more you do it the more it pays off sometimes interesting yeah, yeah. and the, the the soloist jobs pay like triple what the choir jobs pay generally yeah. Um, but you know, it, it can be, it can be very disheartening, uh, sometimes and discouraging. And, and there are, there were moments in my twenties where I was like, you know, every year there it's everybody that I know that's a musician goes through this, these like phases of like, I need to quit. I need to do something else or, and some people do. And then, and then they, they find out like, oh my gosh, I'm like happy doing other things. That's great. Um, yeah. but if you need to, you have this like need to like communicate for me, it's a need to communicate through sound or arts or something. It's like the inner bohemian spirit in me. I just need, I need beauty, truth and freedom and love, you know, I need that in my life. You know? <laughs> so, um, but I'm really, I, I think at this point, um, I am more clear about my expectations for music and like, it, it, I think at this point, it's not about being the world's best singer or anything like that. It's just doing good music, producing truthful art, and then also like figuring out how to support myself in, in other avenues so that I can not rely on 
singing as, as um, an income. So it, it, it cuts really close every month. Um, I'd say like the most security I have is like six months of financial security. So I've been operating in my 20s with like basically six months of security. That's the most. Sometimes it's just two or three months. I can only see two or three months ahead. Or sometimes I'll have a gig nine months from now or a year and a half from now. Wow. So it's hard to calculate the finances for that. But I, at least I know for the next few months how things are going to be. It's, it's really scary. That's better so, than most people, Mindy, because some people live paycheck to paycheck. You know I know. I mean? so I if know, you have six months of savings, I think that's really good. Yeah, that was at probably, you know, that was, I'm being generous, like, that was probably at the yeah. good, good spots of my life. Um, nowadays, I, you know, I've settled into handling that a little bit better. So I'm singing with groups that pay better, like unionized groups, or just, just groups that pay their musicians better. You know, when yeah. you start off, you can't be too super picky. I'm super curious, Mindy, you, you mentioned that people who are more well off get better gigs. How do you get good gigs? Like, is it your experiences, your professional, like, education and music? Or how do you get those good gigs? Do you have to know people? You gotta you sing to well. <laughs> okay. You gotta perform <laughs> well. It does not matter what school, what diploma you got. It does not matter at all. So how you get the good jobs, I guess you just have to keep practice. It's like a, you have to think about it like being an athlete. You just have to keep training, keep improving, stay in shape, take care of your body, take care of your mental health. And each time an audition comes around, whether it's a friend sending it to you, whether you found out about it online, you just have to bring it. Like you just have to like prepare for it and get in a cute dress, put on some heels, wow them, you know, just wow them. Mindy, it seems like there are times where you didn't know if you would be able to make rent or you, if you had enough money oh, yeah. for the next month. Yeah. Do you have side hustles that you participate in to help oh, supplement yeah. that income? And I'm also wondering at what point is this sustainable as a full-time job? At what point, I guess, would people say you made it, you know? Uh, you're, you Sorry, should Sorry, that's always... two questions. No, 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 I love, I love it. I'm, I'm gonna try to be, I'm gonna try to give you a practical answer and then also like how I feel about the right answer for myself. But, um, well, the last question was like, how do you know you made it? You, yeah. you, for me, you define your success based on like how musically fulfilled you are. I, I mean, I, I've already done the sing everything, say yes to everything that comes my way. And that doesn't always make me happy because sometimes I'm doing it for a paycheck, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, or it's great, but maybe I was just, I took on too many gigs that season and I'm just tired. Like maybe I just really liked that gig, but I didn't have time or energy to put towards that. Um, so I think I define musical success as being musically fulfilled, personally, doing the projects I that. that I want to do. So a lot of people in today, 21st century, were like, what is the, how, what's the longevity of opera? Like people like me are in a different, we need, we're, we have to kind of keep the industry going. We need to find innovative ways to bring classical music to young people. It, it's not like you don't just make it like, I guess to make it means you back, maybe back from my teacher's generation, my voice teacher's generation, making it meant you had a record label. You're like a famous household, like opera singer at, singing at the biggest opera houses, La Scala, Metropolitan Opera of New York. Um, and you have an agent, maybe uh, you, well, well, most people have agents in Europe. That's pretty normal. Not so much in the U.S. Um, and you made it because you're doing it full time and you are really good at what you do. You, you're just really good at it. You're consistent. Um, you just, you, you're a consistent product, even though we're not perfect and still even famous singers have bad, bad recordings. So that's making it from our, from, from university, which is already an outdated, I feel like education system for me, for classical singing. They train everybody to be like some opera singer, but really the reality of working as a classical musician is that you you do projects with your friends. You might start your own group. You 
uh, you might get really niche into medieval music. That happens. Um, maybe you only sing 10 roles, 10 opera roles. It is on your, in your bag. You just go around the world singing those 10 roles. That's really boring for me. Like I, I need, I love the variety of singing in professional choirs where you have to interact with other singers. You have to listen to them. And then I also like working as a concert soloist because you get to listen to the orchestra behind you, supporting you. It's a, it's a very intoxicating feeling and, and fulfilling like moment if you work really hard, working with a good orchestra and then you put it together and people pay and, and to see you. And then afterwards they, they say things to you like, I needed this or like you see, like my, my brother came to a show and I, I just saw like a change and my brother and my sister-in-law after they came and saw the concert or something like it just takes people out of where they are um so yeah there, for me the, there's, a, there's the different categories and it's a matter of like how do i fit it all in to make enough money i guess and, and you there's no guarantee it's always like you're just always hustling i guess you 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 pick gigs there's like a principle where it's like the the principle of three um, if you like the music, it's with good people, like maybe your friends and it pays well, that's the golden three. That's like, you say yes yeah. to a gig when, you know, like that. Isn't I, that for anything a, in life? That's what we want. Is in anything is in life. Good pay, good people, yeah. good work. Like exactly. good work. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of the same thing, but it sometimes it takes a while to get to that point where you can be picky. So I've, the different jobs that I've worked, ooh, ooh, there's, there's a lot, there's, there's a lot, I'm like the queen of part-time jobs, um, and there were great times where, like, I made enough money singing, and even though it was tight, at least I didn't have to do other types of jobs, but I, I like the variety of doing, so in college I did catering, um, and then I worked at as a um, and during the summers. That's when I worked as a waitress um, at, at a sushi restaurant. Did mom. you get free sushi? A, a little bit, not that. <laughs> so she was, yeah, my, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like I could have eaten more sushi. Let's just say that. Um, and then she could have uh, cooked it up a bit more. Yeah, she totally could have cooked it up a little bit more. And. <laughs> In grad school, uh, we, we were luckily stipend to be in the semi-professional choir, so that kind of paid for it, but I also had church jobs and gigs. Um, then I worked at another, like a Taiwanese wine cafe, I've walked dogs, I've worked at a um, store called Koss before. When I moved, first moved to LA, I was walking dogs on WAG, like that oh app. God, I, love I, that. That, yeah. I want to do that! Yeah, dude, I like... I just go over, I get to like hang out with dogs. It was a very tiring job, but I got to get to know like the LA city, like the different like parts of LA. So that was good. Um, yeah, I worked, I worked at a clothing store twice. That one time was in high school. I worked at American Eagle in high school. <laughs> I don't know if you guys worked in high school. Did you have, did you guys have high school jobs? Yay! What were they? Mine was so typical Asian. I was um, a tutor at Kumon. <laughs> yes! <laughs> I worked as a hostess at Applebee's, and then I worked at Hollister. Oh, my God. Did I remember when you worked at Hollister? When was that? Everyone from our high school worked at Hollister. All our friends were there. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I remember. Yeah. That's cool. That's all right. That's cool. Applebee's. Oh, my God. <laughs> Applebee's was good because you got tips. So you actually could make quite a bit of money. Yeah. So you guys stopped, were able to stop doing that once college, did you do stuff in college? Or oh yeah. You, yeah, for sure. Was college was expensive. College I, I have, tutored. Okay. And you were, you were like a nanny too, right? Or I did nanny. Yeah, tutor, oh. nanny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, did, I had a crazy job in um w not even in college well in college I was like a lab assistant but in um dental school I was this like they call it an apartment coordinator but I would like do nasty stuff like I would have to like plunge toilets and stuff oh, and, like, when you said nasty stuff I'm like like what <laughs> 
no, not dirty, like, not dirty stuff, but like, well, I guess plunging toilet is like literally dirty, but um, it was it a crazy- It character. Job. Yeah, no, it does. I am so glad I have that job because basically we were like the after hour maintenance crew. So someone calls in, they're like, I have a leaky ceiling and I show up, don't know anything about like plumbing. All I did was, okay, let's put a bucket under there to catch the water. And then the next business day, <laughs> someone will come to fix it. You came to assess the situation. Kind of, kind of. But I would get calls at like 3 a.m. It was a very anxiety-inducing job. It's like being on call. You would hear the pager go off and you're like, shoot, yeah. I have to go out. It definitely builds character because I had to think on the fly like crazy. It was a lot of like customer service too. But yeah, sorry, I, I digress, but that's a whole nother episode. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Judy, I can imagine you like plunging your toilet. No, think about it. This is, these were like college, ki- college and grad kids. They yeah. were like partying all night long. Half of the time I was like plunging puke. Mm-hmm. It was disgusting. And then, and then at your job now, you're like, all right, so, the, you know, you're like doing a root canal. No, at my like, job, I'm just like getting, I'm getting puked on. Like, I'm st- <laughs> I can never escape puke. <laughs> but anyway, oh, um, so side hustles, Mindy. Side, side hustles. hustles. I think I told you, I, I've nannied for so many different people, and I, I, that, that, I think I mentioned almost, I can't remember all my side hustles. They're usually, like, so, so short and in between. I, Recently, the side hustle was actually the tech job, the business development tech job that I worked for almost a year, but then COVID happened. Um, so now I'm just, I'm starting my own business now, um, which yeah. is I'm like, I like was talking to all these like tech people and CEOs start like with their companies and their websites are tech company made websites. And like, I was like, you know, I've being a, being a self a freelancer is kind of like running your own business anyway. Now I just have to keep doing what I love, which is, um, I mean, I'm, I think with this T venture, I'm kind of doing a certification to be a sommelier uh, slash T master type of thing. Okay. We have to rewind a bit. (laughs) Yes. What's the rewind? (laughs) Rewind. How has COVID affected your music career? And what is this? How did you get into this new business venture? Yeah. Um, so so before COVID, this season was the working in LA season. So yeah. um, I was singing with choirs, you know, just doing the usual types of different groups. And uh, about four times a week, three to four times a week, I would be at this job, maybe like 20 hours a week, 15 hours a week. You know, that really helped me out financially a lot, but it's very exhausting because, you know, I'll drive somewhere in the daytime and then go to rehearsal at night and then wake up and do it again. So up till COVID, I was working a part-time job, a, a pretty good part-time job, um, and and that was stimulating because it took me out of all the things I worry about in music. I was like, okay, I don't need to think about singing my voice or anything like for this other half of my life, or morning half of my life. Um, and because of COVID, there's no concerts anymore. There's I mean, maybe there's in other countries where they've handled it better, they're starting to do more. So right now, I was just still working, doing virtual recordings for my church. Right now, uh, the project that I have uh, going on right now that was postponed. So this summer, I would have maybe been in San Diego doing a musical theater um, project. Um, I would have been at the University of, like, uh, Mississippi doing a Renaissance choral workshop. What else did I have? Like, there was a lot of other things I had going on this summer. So none of that's happening. And all, all my other acquired concerts and everything that was done. So I was actually like, this is amazing. I don't have to drive anywhere in LA yeah. and I can just self care and the government's going to stimulus money me. What? <laughs> this is amazing. So no, I took it as it, it's, it was like, I was really exhausted anyway. So it was kind of like serendipitous for me. I mean, you know, COVID has been really tough on everybody, but I think that it's been luckily a good time for me to stay at home and take care of myself. You, you, you can give so much of your energy and body. Like i I aged so much from grad school to now because 
of running around, traveling, sleeping really late because concerts sometimes end at 10 and you need to wind down all your cortisol, all your adrenaline. Sometimes it takes time to get to bed and then get home, get to bed, turn off your brain. So, I mean, I was thinking like, this is my opportunity to take this time to think, to not be beholden to my singing career. Cause so many times I've been like, is there something else I can do? Cause I've experienced working with people that are pretty high up in my industry. And I was like, that's the life I could be living. I don't think that's the life for me. The, the life of traveling, traveling around, like, especially if you're an opera singer, you leave for like a month or two and you grow an entirely different family for that month or two, which I've done before. Like you just kind of, sometimes I've been on the roads for, uh, I've been on the road for many years where like, there's like a three, three or four month chunk where I'm basically, maybe I went home for one week or maybe I wasn't home for that three, four months. And then at the end of the four months, you're like, oh my God, I'm so tired, you know, but like I did all these things or like, um, especially for some of the health issues that I had with allergies and stuff. I, my finding energy was always like a huge thing. So, um, this COVID has been an opportunity to just like be at home and rest and have a regular schedule. I've never had such a regular schedule in my life since like, I I don't know, like high school or college where like I can wake up, have a morning routine. Like what even is that? (laughs) <laughs> and actually think about like, okay, what are my values? My values is being with family and friends and, and connecting with people and doing something, using my talents to do something good, right? That's what we all aim to do. And I liked how Judy talked about like work-life balance like that. With that. I really like that idea. It's hard to have work-life life balance if you're a traveling artist because you miss, you do miss family events. You, you miss a lot of stuff. Um, So it it can feel isolating already because you're traveling around like promoting your own self. It it gets really like in your own head. And I don't like that. I think it just makes you kind of unhappy. So um, the the tea interests have been kind of building up for a few years now. Um, And you can like read about it more when I launched Minimalist Tea in 2021. Oh Oh my gosh, exciting! so the idea is like, I mean, I, I, I've, I've drunk tea in most of my life, but I was really inspired by, I have an uncle who's really into Chinese Kung Fu tea, which is like a whole, you know, you just sit around, you drink from cups that are like half this size, literally the cups are like this big. And I was just like, what is this all about? You know, what is this from my Chinese culture? I, I, I like tea. I'm a singer, but what is this? Like, why are we drinking tea from small cups? So we went to China in April last year, and um, uh, I saw a girl who's about my age pouring tea, and I was like, she did it so carefully, and you can see on my Instagram, there's like one, I I took a little video of her doing it, and she said she'd been studying for seven years how to pour tea. I was like, that's like almost as long as I've been studying singing. Like, this girl's like studying tea for seven years? So I, I, you know, I discussed it with my uncle, like, what is this all about? It's, there's a lot of history in tea, and I'm, I'm a person who's really interested in tea, and I mean, in history, and also, like, there's a performance to it. There's a performance aspect to tea ceremonies, and it teaches a person patience. It teaches you uh, things that I, things that I need to work on, like patience, really being mindful of every single object you have in your life. I I, want to like just as a 30 year old now, like I want to take out all the things that are not working in my life, get rid of it and invite things that are working and bring fulfillment and happiness and good health to me and people around me. Mm -hmm. So that's what tea is teaching me. It's, It's so much more than the beverage. So I want to develop that into a mindful living type of brand or, or, just something that's about healthy, mindful living, like health. And, and you guys know me, like, you know, my mom, you know, the things that I've talked about, like, I, I'm sure some interaction that we had at, at an early age was about health. Yeah. I don't know if you remember any of it. I don't know what I said to you, but I'm sure I worried about it, you know, then as well. So that's an influence from my mom as well. But I think just being a, a classical singer, you have to 
just be so healthy mentally and physically. And if you're not there, you can't really be this like superhuman that people want you to be on stage. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I want to know more about this tea thing because this is the first time I'm hearing about it. Are you specializing in like actually producing the tea or more of like the mindfulness, that type of thing? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, this is the vision that I have for minimalist tea is at first I'm going to produce some content about maybe some personal things, maybe teach people about some basic things about tea, maybe some recipes, and then also maybe answer some questions about I don't know, mindfulness, like peace. I want to create like a peaceful, healthy, relaxing type. I of love life. that. I'm so excited. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's going to be fun for me. So, so that's going to be um, on YouTube and Patreon. So Patreon will be more exclusive personal content um, that people can subscribe to. So that's phase one. So once I develop like my idea of what it means to be minimalist tea, once I develop that even more, then I want to maybe have a small tea shop just a small one, a minimalist tea shop, just, and then so that I can send my products to other people, like you guys, if I'm like interviewing, you know, or interviewing with people, then I can have them drink from my tea vessels, or I can talk about the tea or something. I think, I think it's, it's just a really easy way to be healthy. That's, that's like something that I hope to develop into a uh, a side hustle that will help support my music career and it, it can work together yeah, it's, yeah 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 um the project that I'm working on for music is a nine piece set for piano trio that's cello piano and violin with voice so there's a composer who's commissioning a piece for himself he, he just commissioned it and he's gonna we're gonna record it and put it on a private music label so, and I, I already have some, um, I had some releases this year. One is a 4K opera performance on YouTube that you can check out um, on my YouTube at Mindy Ella. And um, I also had uh, two different, a, a solo piece on Apple Music with Stanford University. Um, that's the Duraflé Requiem. There's this really gorgeous mezzo solo in there with organ and cello. It's very beautiful. Check it out if you want. And also something I did in grad school was I had some other, another solo recording on there. So there's, I'm starting to get like little recordings out there and COVID is helping people digitize things. So all the stuff that I was doing before that's kind of just for a live audience is finally being recorded because we have no choice. So in that way, it's actually good. But yeah, I mean, that's that's I think I answered a lot of your questions right yeah thank yes, you, thank you so sharing. much Mindy yeah thank you for being so curious thank you so much it means a lot you have jobs like don't you have to you have to go work now <laughs> I do have to go work now okay. well, you guys have, uh, thank you so much again and we'll talk we'll talk soon please keep yes, yes. keep yeah. in touch and I look forward to the next tea ceremony absolutely yeah. hey thanks guys Thanks, Mindy. Have a good day. Bye, Mindy. Thank you so much.